to remind members using devices that you must mute and turn off your sound to avoid feedback. Consider turning off your video if you intend to use the keyboard for taking notes. For good sound quality, is it important for members to speak clearly and be mindful of the location of the microphones? At the same time, be aware that from most parts of the room, the microphones in the room pick up sound very well. Be careful about side conversations. The committee room computer will be muted at lunch break. A committee member will need to unmute it before we resume after lunch. However, today we won't be resuming after lunch because our one o'clock presentation uh, has to be rescheduled because the Senate Finance Committee called the people who will be um, making that presentation to speak on HB2 in the Department of Energy before Senate Finance today. So. All right, this is a pre-hearing announcement for attendees. The sign-up sheet will stop accepting new in entries for those who wish to speak at 8 a.m. the day of the committee's hearing. This is not a committee hearing, so that's not really relevant. I won't finish the rest of that pre-hearing announcement. Instead, as chair of the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as the result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a- Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is a session, uh, a Good public morning. session. <laughs> We can hear you. Can you hear us? I'm not sure. Anyway, this is a public hearing on bills referred to the, or a uh, work session rather, on bills referred to the committee and scheduled in the House calendar for today. We are not planning to do any executive sessions today. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I confirm that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. The public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been Good made morning, Lee. in the house calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House Rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 2713600 or email hcs at ledge.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Any votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote, and we'll start by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during the meeting that's required under the right to know law. So Mr. Clerk, would you call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Doug Thomas is not present in the room, but I understand he's at a, a chair, vice chair meeting. Is that correct? And he's on his way? Yes. Then I'll back him as a president. Uh, Representative Harrington. Here. Representative Nodder. She's at the meeting. She's where? She's at the same meeting. Same meeting. Same meeting. Uh, Representative Murner here. Here. Uh, Representative Plett here. Uh, Representative uh, Berezny. Here in the committee room. Okay. And I have to wait for a second till this hourglass shuts off. Uh, Representative Bernardi. Here in committee. Representative Campbell's. Uh, Representative Campbell's. Here in my home in Loudoun alone. Okay. Representative Plogier. Present in committee. Rep Representative Somsich. I'm here. I'm here. Representative White. I'm here in the committee. Representative Somsich. Yes, I'm present in here in Portsmouth, and there's nobody else in the house with me. Representative Callie Pitts. I saw you on the screen, Representative Callie Pitts. Apparently, she can't hear us. 
I'll mark her present. I saw her on the screen. Representative Mann. I'm here at home, no one with me. Representative Loxenum. Present in Plainfield. I'm alone in my office, but there are other people in the house. Representative Vincent. Representative Vincent. Representative McGee. Representative McGee. Okay. Uh, Representative McWilliams. I'm present at my home with my family. Rep Rep Representative Creature. I am here in my home alone and there's a lot of background noise today, sorry. Representative Pimentel. Here on my patio, my sister and wife may pass occasionally, but essentially alone. Okay, Representative uh, Paschel. Here alone. Okay, uh, uh, Chairman Bose is here. So I have uh, 18 present, three missing, but uh, I will, uh, if uh, Representative McGee shows up, I'll make a mark our present. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Representative McGee informed me over the weekend that she has a delegation subcommittee meeting this morning and she will join our meeting once she gets out of that meeting, which could be around 10.30. I'm mocking a present now. <laughs> if you so choose, yeah. that, that would be fine. Okay, so the purpose of our meeting this morning is to uh, discuss a couple of Senate bills to which we are likely to make amendments. The calendar notice for the House scheduling notice sent out by committee assistant Morris stated that it would be just on Senate Bill 91, but we're actually gonna also talk about Senate Bill 78 this morning, as well as Senate Bill 91. Mr. Chair, let me start with the pledge. And, um, Mr. Chair, are, do we have a problem getting Representative Callie Pitts in? I don't have a problem. Uh, I don't know uh, if she has a problem or not. It's, it's hard to tell at this point. If one of you has her email and her, or her- uh, Representative Bose, I'm just putting together an email message to represent Callie Pitts now with a, a few things she might want to try. Um, okay. For her audio, yeah. Like we both. Could Good we wait a that. few moments until she is with us? Can you hear? I see you here. I can hear you. Can hear you. Hear us? I have no sound. No uh, sound. Okay. Mr. Chair. I heard her say no sound. Re well, hit the unmute. We can certainly hear her, but she's apparently not hearing us. Mr. Chair. Yes. Or Representative Bernardi. Yes, go ahead. Are you starting with the pledge? Yes, we forgot to do that. Didn't we? Okay, everybody at home, please uh, mute your microphones and join us as Can representative. Can thing, but I guess I'm not missing much. Representative White will be as in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Jackie, we can hear you. I don't know if you can hear us. The cat. Thank you, Representative you. Bernardi, for the reminder about the pledge. Appreciate that. Had a little bit of a hectic morning. Uh, the chairs and vice chairs meeting, which normally takes place at nine o'clock this morning, was started late. It didn't start till nine thirty. So I've been rushing around trying to get here on time. That's the. Uh, the result of, uh, of the cause for some of the uh, confusion here this morning. Thank there you for some... your efforts on our behalf, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry? She, she said thank you. You're muted. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to thank the chairman for his efforts on our behalf. We, we understand it can be difficult trying to be in two places at one time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, chairmen should be able to bilocate. 
Oh, that's what it is, by locate. Right. Representative Callie Pitts, can you hear us now? Now I can, I had to get out and come back. Oh, I don't wow. know why. So now you can hear us, excellent. Now I can hear you. Wonderful. Well, in just a few minutes, I'd like to talk about uh, Senate Bill 78. But before we do that, I need to alert the committee and have a brief discussion about a Senate message. The Senate concurs with the House of Representatives in the passage of the following entitled bill with amendments. In the passage of which amendments, the Senate asks the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The bill in question is House Bill 315 relative to the aggregation of electric customers. And the Senate modified this bill twice. They modified it in committee by adding the language of Senate Bill 109. And the language of Senate Bill 109 is very similar to the language in House Bill 106, which is a bill that we retained. And uh, it's, it's a slightly um, pared down version of what was in House Bill 106, but the portion that they kept was the municipal host customer generator section. The second amendment that the Senate added was a floor amendment that they added when they passed this amended bill on the House floor. <clears throat> and the second amendment added the language that's at the tail end of Senate Bill 91, Section 4, under utility property tax exclusion from the definition of utility property. And the reason they added that to this bill is because it goes along with Senate Bill 109, which they previously added to House Bill 315, but forgot to add the section about utility property tax exemptions. So that's the entirety of the changes that they made to House Bill 315. And my inclination would be to concur with these changes, but I would like to hear from other members of the committee to hear what uh, your opinions might be on this question of concurrence. Representative Platt is Mr. recognized Chairman, for a question. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I think I've got this. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I couldn't follow all of those changes. And so I have no opinion. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Oxenham is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I believe I'm agreeing with, with the representative Plett. I, I would like to see the actual text before I, certainly before I uh, could vote to, uh, to concur. Okay, what I suggest you do in that case is um, go to the general court website and look up Senate Bill 109, SB 109. You can there read the text that the Senate has attached to House Bill 315. And then the second part is the language that's at the end of Senate Bill 91, which we have before us today. So those are the two amendments that they added to HB 315. I'd still wonder, like to have an opportunity to read them and consider them before we move to a, a concurrence vote. I'm not gonna ask for a vote on concurrence. I just wanna get people's opinions. Thank uh, you. The decision is ultimately mine, sure. but um, I would like to hear what other people have to say. So thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Partial, you're recognized. Yes, I'm sorry if I'm being very concrete here, but I am looking at Senate Bill 109 as amended by the Senate. And is are we taking that language verbatim 
or have they altered it in order to uh, fit it into their into House Bill fee one five? They took the language of Senate Bill one oh nine as passed by the Senate and okay. then attached it as an amendment to House Bill three one five. And the second question I have, if I may share, yes, is um, we are looking at Amendment 4 today as part of our uh, discussion. And so it would be hard to find concurrence with the amendment until we discuss it ourselves. Isn't that true? No, I don't think so, because it's just the utility property tax exemption section. I think we can concur with that without necessarily concurring with all of part four of SB 91. Okay, well, I'll trust in your judgment then. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Gally Bitz. You're muted. You probably wanna keep me muted. As one of the bills, one of the people who worked on this bill very hard, I take umbrage at the Senate sending something over uh, with sight unseen. I asked, three times because I could not pull up the first amended version and I could not get it. Uh, so going back to 109 was the, the amendment I believe is 1294 or something like that, but I could not get the amendment. I, I couldn't pull it up on the website. I called the clerk's office and I think it's a great, great disadvantage to be asking the committee to concur on anything we have not been able to see and compare and contrast. If we were in the house right now, we would be able to go to a drawer, pull out the bills and, and look at them and compare them and, and make notes on them. We have not been able to do that. And the Senate loves to go for one scoop, two scoops, three <clears throat> scoops, four scoops on the bus and add. Well, that's the truth. And at this point, I don't know if I disagree, disagree with what they've done or not. I think there are some problems on it. We haven't had a public hearing on it. We haven't had, I, I don't think they've had a hearing on their amendment either, even though it's taken from another bill. And apparently there's problems with that amendment. Um, I want to see it. I'm one of those show me people. So I would, I don't know what's the deadline, but I believe we would probably at least have another week to look at this. And I would love to look at it, probably go along with it. I don't know. And have at least another week. I even asked Cliff amendment house bill 315. And I got no answer. He came back with 91 and what he was looking at on 91. So I really would like to compare and contrast and have that opportunity. Um, I've spent more on printer ink this month, this year than I've ever spent because I want the, I want the paper in front of me. I wanna see it. And it's- Okay, thank you. That, and that's all I can say is, and if you're gonna take that position, it's my bill and I'm going to, my decision, I, I, I would take umbrage with that. And I don't, I, I don't argue much, but I, I think we need to be able to thoroughly vet it. Okay, thank you for your comments. Let me uh, try to help everybody understand how you can get access to the language of the amendment. If you go to the bill docket, yeah. House Bill 315, you should be able to see where the Senate attached amendment number 2021-1294S. And if you click on that, that amendment number should be um, highlighted in blue in the bill docket. And if you click on it, it should bring up the text of the amendment. So then you can read exactly what the Senate attached to House Bill 315. That way, if you have any doubts about whether or not you could agree, you could accept or concur with this 
amendment to 315, you'll have the language right in front of you. And uh, uh, what is the floor amendment? The floor amendment, if you go to Senate Bill 91, part okay. four, and look at the last portion of that bill, it says utility property tax exclusion from definition of utility property. The exact language that's in Senate Bill 91, part four, about utility property tax was added to this bill. And the reason they did that is because they were not sure that Senate Bill 91 would pass and out of our committee. And so as a result, they wanted to make sure this language got into statute. So they attached it as an amendment to House Bill 315. And does that have an amendment number? It must. It does. It is 2021-1400S. Uh, uh, Representative Vos, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I can, I can send those two amendments around to the committee if that would be helpful. Yes. Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you. I'll do that right now. Thank you. All right, so let me back up a little bit and explain uh, before I call on Representative Harrington, explain how we got here. So the Senate passed Senate Bill 109. It came out of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee with a five to nothing vote. And it then went to the Senate floor where it passed on a 24 to nothing vote. At that point, the Senate tabled the bill. Now, why did they do that? They did that because they didn't want the bill to come to the House. They, want, they were afraid that if it came to the House, that we would make changes to it in the House. So they tabled the bill with the idea that they would attach it to another House bill at a later date so that they could be sure to get it passed without changes being made to it. And in that regard, they were probably correct. If Senate Bill 109 had come to us from the Senate, we probably would have changed it here in the House. We have House Bill 106, which we've already discussed several times, uh, that we were planning to make changes to. And because we retained House Bill 106, we can still make changes to the language that currently is now attached to House Bill 315. So for a six or eight month period, the language in House Bill 315 will be the uh, operable language, but we can make modifications to it later if we so choose. So that's how we got to the place that we're at today. And um, I hope that explanation helps everybody understand where, we're, where we are. So Representative Harrington, uh, you're recognized for a comment. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me start out by, I realize it's Monday morning, but I tell you, you've got me buffaloed. Uh, I'm still trying <laughs> to figure out what the hell's going on here with 106 and 315 and 109. And what is the actual thing that we're looking to make a decision on whether we agree with or not? And that's 315 as amended by, and I see three different amendments as amended by the Senate. Is that the final thing we're looking at? Yes. HB 315 as amended by the Senate and is uh, April 2021-074-88H and there's a 1294-S and a 1400-S. Correct. That's, we're, that's we're the bill. Charged, we're charged with making a decision about whether to concur or non-concur with the changes that the Senate made. Okay, and is there a place that we can have, and I think that someone said they were gonna do this, to see these, in, I'm assuming the first amendment must have come, did that come out of the house? The one that's dated uh, April 9th? No. Okay, those all yes. came out of the Senate. So can we see those three amendments by themselves so we can find out exactly what they changed as compared to what we sent over? Because I thought 315 as we sent it was pretty good. Well, let's be clear. The First Amendment, the one on April 9th, came from us, okay. not the Senate. The only two amendments that came from the Senate were 1294S and 1400S. Okay. And Jen 
for our committee researchers said that she would send those two amendments by email them. to all members of the committee. Mike, just say Okay, that'll be very helpful because trying to follow this otherwise is to trying to go back and look and see what was this changed or what was changed from the Senate version to the House version is it, kind of difficult to do. So but that'll be helpful when we get them. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. I understand that uh, this is difficult and ultimately I have to make the decision on concur or non-concur. And as I indicated that at the beginning of this conversation, my inclination is to concur but uh, I would appreciate hearing from anybody else who has any comments on this resolution. Uh, yeah, we've got the email from for the, with those uh, Senate amendments now. At least I have. Okay. Well, let's not spend any more time on this this morning since you guys want to read those amendments. Uh, we'll talk about it again next Monday or Tuesday when we have an exec session on Senate Bill 78, Senate Bill 91, and Senate Bill 113. We will be having exec sessions on those three bills either next Monday the 24th or next Tuesday the 25th. There is a scheduling logistics error uh, situation that I'm dealing with right now. And so I don't know exactly when we'll be doing it, but I should know by the end of the uh, day today which of those two days we'll be having the exec session. So for now, let's turn our attention to Senate Bill 78. And I have sent everyone on the committee um, a suggested amendment to Sen Senate Bill 78, which keeps the language of the original bill, but just adds to it. It adds the phrase, except when a veto of the biennial budget occurs and spending reverts to a continuing resolution, only then shall renewable energy fund expenditures require approval by the General Court Fiscal Committee. So that is the proposed amendment. Now, what is the rationale for that amendment? Well, we're extremely fortunate this morning to have in attendance here in our committee, the chair of uh, House Finance Division One, Representative Lynn Ober. And Lynn, um, Representative Ober suggested to me that this change might be necessary to uh, make this bill acceptable to the House. And I've asked Representative Lo Ober if she could come here this morning and tell us about the rationale for making this change. So Representative Ober, if you could move over to one of these portable mics, um, I would allow you to give us an explanation for why you thought um, this language change was necessary. Thank you, Mr. Over. Chairman. Thank you. When we have a continuing resolution, that means that all spending that the current legislature had approved, but the governor vetoed, is canceled. And it reverts to what is known as the previous biennium, where the continuing resolution continues the budget under which everybody has been operating for the last two years. This year, for example, we passed a budget that's lower with tax cuts that's gone to the Senate. But should that fail and we would revert, we would revert to a budget that spends a great deal more money with no tax cuts. Every agency would like to have all of their money so that nobody can tell them how to spend it. If you put it into a dedicated fund, which this does, and we do that a lot, and then you say it is continually appropriated you do not know or have any control over how that money is being spent. But if you use the amendment that the chairman suggested, when there is a continuing resolution, any agency that wants to spend above and beyond what was in the previous budget, i.e. not in the continuing resolution, must come to fiscal committee, explain their project, justify why it needs to be done now and get the approval. 
And there are a lot of agencies that do that now. For example, um, parks programs under construction are normally done in the summer. We have a hard time constructing up here in the winter. So if the budget fails and we have, for example, a million dollars worth of improvements in two of our parks that are needed in the coming year for safety and expansion for people, they could not do that. But they could come to fiscal and say, here's our proposal, here's the money, we'd like approval to go ahead. So if you use this amendment, you give the legislature the continued right to control spending until a budget passes. Finance has been starting to put this kind of language into many of the dedicated funds that exist today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Ober. Uh, I have a question. If the money that goes into the Renewable Energy Fund does not come from the budget, but actually comes from um, alternative compliance payments that the utilities make when they can't buy renewable energy credits, does that make a difference? No, it doesn't. We should really be controlling whatever spending is going on during our biennium, even if we do not have access to a budget. You don't know what was in the previous one. Previous budgets can spend money out of every dedicated fund if they want. You simply put that section into House Bill 2 and you have suspended the law. If the veto of the budget is made, then the old House Bill 2, which suspends the law, continues. So there are a lot of things that can go on that may not be what you expected to have go on. Okay, thank you. Representative uh, Harrington is recognized for a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Lynn, for uh, stepping in here today. This has been very helpful. Question for you, though. The, um, if it talks about when a veto of the biennial budget occurs, what if there's just a budget isn't passed because it comes up for a vote and we don't get a majority vote? It's, it, does that need to be addressed as well? It would seem to be like we'd fit into the same circumstances as a veto. Yeah, if the budget doesn't pass, Mike, you are correct. It would go to a continuing resolution. I don't know is how the majority party ever goes to the floor when you're coming up to for the final vote on the budget without a continuing resolution in their pocket, because you cannot simply do things like close the state hospital and kick all the people on the street right. and kick all the neighbors off, say, no, you can't get your car registered. No, you can't renew your driver's license. You have to have a way to continue basic functions that are going on in the state that we all rely on. I, I guess my question is, does this need to be addressed? Or do we have to say, except when a, it just says when a veto and it reverts I, to a continuing I hear resolution. What, I hear what you say. I didn't actually write that language. Um, your point is correct. I would think since this is the chairman's language, that is up to him whether he wants to do it that way or just when there is a veto. So your point is correct. If it said, if a budget didn't pass, whether it be a veto or a lack of vote on the floor, you would take care of it. But the chairman could also write an amendment this way that it would affect only a veto. So okay. this is his language, not mine. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that point, uh, Representative Harrington. That would seem to indicate that some additional language would be necessary here. So we'll, I'll make a note of that. One other thing I should point out. Um, well, no, I, I'll point that out later. Um, Representative Callie Pitts, you're recognized for a question. Representative Oba, I'm a very simplistic thinker. So when this amendment passes, does it change anything? Does it still allow the fiscal committee to spend the money in the energy fund whatever way it wants, which it would do anyway if we didn't have this particular amendment? It allows, it, uh, that's a good question, but it allows the fiscal committee not to spend it any way they want, but to reply positively to the agency request for how to spend it. So, so you I, have I, that control whether you say it or not, but the fiscal committee cannot write its own proposal to spend the money. It only reply, it only responds to what is proposed by the agency so I, again, I, I 
may I clarify? Yes, go ahead. Again, so that my my brain under wraps around this. This money, we have no budget. This law goes away until we do have a budget, correct? And then without a budget, if there's money in the energy fund, could we take that money, for instance, or could the fiscal committee take what they believe is excess or money that's not committed and use it, say, for education? No, they cannot. They cannot write their own proposal. So they, they can, can only, only use it for energy. They can only respond to the agency request. And I assume the agency would only ask to spend it on energy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Somsich is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Ober. Um, <clears throat> I just want to ask you whether you believe that this this the language here helps us with the problem we're trying to solve here. We've heard from uh, uh, during testimony about this that one of the problems we have right now is that uh, uh, projects, energy efficiency and renewable energy projects are, are often put on hold all of a sudden if uh, the uh, once the, the budget year comes to an end, even if there's money in that budget, unless they can uh, unless everything is, is uh, paperwork is completed on time, uh, they have to wait till the next budget appropriation until they can fund these projects. And in the meantime, the energy fund has money there, but it was from last last year's appropriations. And I believe that the the idea be, behind this bill was to make sure that the money that was there from Last year's appropriation continued to be used for this purpose going forward so that businesses have a predictability about when there's a project that's been approved that they're going to get that kind of funding. Um, does this, do you think this helps in any way alleviate that problem? If the project's been approved, the money has already been allocated. So even um, there's no reason for a project to stop at the end of one year if the money's been allocated. This would allow you to have control over new projects going forward in the small period of time when the state does not have a budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Mann is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, uh, trivial almost in, in uh, importance, but I think the uh, second line says this non this non-lapsing special fund shall be continually appropriated. Uh, it had deleted the sentence that, that, that just, the declarative sentence that stated that the fund was non-lapsing. I think it should be a declarative sentence, a separate one saying it is non-lapsing period. Uh, I think a, this sentence as it reads is just assuming that it's non-lapsing. It doesn't, it's not a proper way to state that it's a not lapsing fund. My own opinion in terms of the English. Okay, thank you for that comment. Representative Oxenham is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Ober. Um, this is an unusual dedicated fund. You know, the, the monies come from these, it's dedicated where they come from and it's dedicated where they're going to. We have had testimony from the agency that they are in a bind because of recent change to the text about non-lapsing and continually appropriated. The issue that you have raised with us is a separate issue. Let's leave the language alone. The language of the bill was is fine the way it came to us. And we all, there was consensus from the, from the group about it the last time we discussed it. The, the issue that you've brought about this particular exceptional circumstance where you might not have a budget is, is something else to be tacked on. And uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't modify whether or not the money's carried forward. But, but we have a real problem with renewable energy projects that they can only apply for the funding at a certain time and they, they go forward with the project and then you get to the end of the fiscal year and the project hasn't been completed. And if they haven't completed it, 
they don't get the money and, and they can't get the money after in the new fiscal year either. So we have we have a very large sum sitting there. We have people desperate to get these projects accomplished. And get, so I, I don't want to take you into any more detail. We, I thank you for being here and I thank you for explaining the bit about the continuing resolution. That's important and, and we should add that, but let's not get involved with the lapsing and the continually appropriated. That was all settled last time. We, we have that language. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Sopcich, did you have another question? No, I didn't, sorry. Okay. Okay. I see no more uh, hands raised. So Representative Ober, I wanna thank you for being here to uh, give us those explanations. We really appreciate that. And, Happy um, to do it, Mr. Chairman. I would, um, I would point out that there is one other uh, potential change uh, to, suggested by this amend, suggest proposed amendment. And that is it adds section two electrical electric renewable portfolio standards amend RSA 362 F colon 4-IC to read as follows C hydrogen derived from biomass fuels water or methane gas now that language was originally in Senate bill 113 and if you'll all recall during the public hearing for 113 Senator Bradley suggested that Senate bill 113 be retained and during the public hearing, I asked him, I said, should the section about hydrogen derived from biomass fuels, water and methane be extracted and put in another bill? And he said, yes, that would be uh, appreciated. So what we've done or what I've done with this proposed amendment is pull that section out of 113 and added it to Senate Bill 78. I discussed this with Senator Bradley and he said that he agrees with that change. So that is the other proposed change for this amendment. Is there any comment on that change, that proposed change? <clears throat> Seeing none. Okay, Representative Oxenham, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I had anticipated we were talking about 91 today. And so I don't have the 78 materials in front of me. As I recall, it was just that one word, water, that, that was added. Yes, that is correct. Thank you very much for clarifying. Representative Sopcich. Yeah, I just want to say, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. I agree with that too. Okay. Any further comments about Senate Bill 78? Okay, let's move on then. I would like now to talk about Senate Bill 91. Two sections of this bill that uh, likely require some amendment to the language. And the first section I'd like to discuss is part one. I sent the committee copies of suggested amendment language for part one and part four. So you all should have it uh, available to you. And I'd be interested in hearing your comments on the uh, proposed language. Most of the changes involved changing phrases like fair compensation, Etc. that was in the original language, fair share and that kind of thing, to a language that the Public Utilities Commission uh, determines is, is more reasonable for these kinds of, for this kind of legislation. And that language is just and reasonable. So you'll notice in several places in the, uh, in the proposed amendment, we change fair share to just and reasonable contr contribution or compensation. Just and reasonable for parties, just and reasonable costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had discussed those changes at the last work session. And so I've incorporated them into this uh, suggested text. I've also added the word actual in a couple of places. 
in front of transmission and distribution costs. And uh, I changed on page three, line nine and 10, the def definition of electric generation equipment. To read that electric generation equipment in this chapter means any equipment that qualifies as energy storage as defined in RSA 74, et cetera. Such equipment shall not be subject to any of the requirements of section three of this job. And that language is more precise and covers uh, <coughs> the intent of the original legislation, which was to exclude energy storage equipment uh, from the provisions of this chapter. So those are the suggested uh, proposed amendment uh, changes. I'd like to hear your ideas. Representative Oxen. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, these, they're, they're, there's a lot of other changes in here as well there. Um, and it's, um, in, in general, I, I think that these are positive changes that, that make a lot of sense. Um, I'm a little, I, I, I would really like to be able to change lines nine through 12 on the last page. And, of, and I think, unfortunately I did not staple my pages together. And so now I'm getting one page from one amendment with the other amendment. I believe it was the second one that you proposed and it's, um, Actually, you were you were just speaking about the definition about primary and electric generation equipment, primary energy. That this is at the very, I think it's the last part of the second amendment that you proposed. Are we in the same place? Yes, that that is the last uh, amendment change that I discussed. Yes, yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not suggesting anything substantive. I just find the um, the lines nine through twelve to be awkward and and difficult to read. I'm not sure that our intention would be completely clear um, if this were ever to become a matter of contention. So I, I just kind of a, a, a highlight that I, I might come in with a proposed amendment next week if if that seemed um, reasonable. The, um, the 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 line 14 about the benefit to low income customers. Uh, seems like a, a, a very um, useful change. Um, it, it, it Again, it's been in the bill before, but this highlights it. Uh, I think the, the most important issue is that the last time we had our discussion, we talked about going beyond simply transmission and distribution costs. And I remember, uh, Representative Bernardi suggesting that, uh, or at least um, reiterating that reliability and resiliency were something that uh, were of such an advantage that we would want to include them as well in, in this language. Um, did you consider that when you were creating this amendment? Did, did, did you not include it because of, of a particular reason? I don't see anywhere in my notes. Um, well, I did send you an email with some suggested language changes. And in, in, in that email, I, I actually quoted uh, Representative Bernardi. Uh, he was summarizing our discussion at the end and saying that the things that we seem to have come to a consensus on. And did you send it, specific language, uh, proposed language? Yes, and in fact, you you and I had a, a at least a, a bit of an email exchange where I uh, apologized for being late in recognizing that you had um, sent me a, an acknowledgement that you had received uh, my language changes and I did receive I, your email and I went over your language changes with Senator Waters and we both thought that some of your changes were just too. Um, involved and too detailed for the purposes of this uh, legislation. But I don't specifically remember anything about reliability. 
Uh, well, uh, the, the reliability and resiliency were not part of any of the specific text that I had suggested. They, it was in the um, in the body of the paragraph. It, we, we hadn't we hadn't devised a way of getting it into the bill, but the concern was not to restrict the, the bill. And, and I must say, you have language here which says including. Um, it, perhaps if we said including but not limited to, because you only have two things listed under including. Sorry, somebody uh, just distracted me. What line specifically are we looking at now? Uh, this, I believe we're in, this, are we in the same place. Um, I think it's line nine and 10. On page three, I believe, at least the way it printed out of my printer on page three. Um, okay, the line about electric generation equipment in this chapter means, is that the uh, line? No, no, no. I, I, I don't think we're there. It, it's it's the one it's the page that starts with the header customer energy storage. Actually, Peter, I, I was in error. I, I believe the point is right at the very beginning of the yeah. um, of of this on um, lines one through three. Uh, for behind the meter storage, the rules or orders shall allow for a bring your own device peak reduction program. Uh, new language, the commission may approve mechanisms for a utility to compensate such projects for the value they actually provide, including, and then there's a substantial amount struck out. So including any transmission or distributional costs actually avoided because of the non-utility energy storage project to the extent practicable based on determinable cost components. So my suggestion here is simply adding after including, but not limited to, rather than get into a, a lengthy discussion about how we might get resiliency and reliability in here, even though those were issues that we discussed last time and we seem to have arrived at a consensus on including. I okay, I've made a note of, of that. Um, that seems like a reasonable change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Representative Callie Pitts. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just actual transmission costs. How do you quantify what is being proposed? Reliability. How do you declare the reliability of the sun for storage or the you know, I, I don't understand that. We're going with concrete here. We're going with limited. Why are we expanding it all of a sudden to generalities? Um, I, I don't, I don't buy that. All right, I can't, I can't fathom that at this point. How do you quantify what's reliable? Um, our own grid isn't reliable. So how do you quantify that? I, I don't I don't understand that. And I, I think that when we get into that kind of a weed on this particular thing, we're now making it more complicated than it really should be. We can get to what actual costs are, but we can't get to some of these things that can't be quantified. And I and I, I think we should leave it alone. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Representative Harrington is recognized for comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two quick things. First, the just for the record, the just and reasonable term, that's actually not a PUC creation. That's right out of uh, FERC rules and federal Perfect. law. That's where it comes from. So that's the appropriate term to use. I have to agree with uh, Representative Callie Pitts on this one. This, uh, uh -oh. including actual avoided transmission and distribution costs, I mean, that is really a, a real difficult not to crack. When you're talking about an individual project and you're going to say that, you know, if you're talking, we're talking small, fairly small customers here 
and how much they're going to save off of a billion dollar transmission system because they're creating, you know, a few megawatts somewhere. And is then you're going to get into time base because remember the transmission is based on the maximum demand for power on whatever that day is in the year. That's what the transmission and distribution systems are based on. And this, I have to agree with her, is a very, very complicated thing to try to come up and assess a value to. Uh, we don't do it for a lot of things. For instance, if you put in a new power plant, you don't get credit for the transmission uh, updates that didn't have to get built because the power plant wasn't there. Uh, that's that that doesn't get uh, that's just savings in transmission costs. The power plant builder doesn't get any uh, rebate saying, well, by building this plant, if we didn't put it in, we were going to have to put in a five hundred million dollar uh, transmission system. But since you put this eight hundred megawatt whatever here, uh, you're going to save transmission costs. Well, that's good, but we're not going to pay you anything for that. So now in this case, we're saying, well, if it does do it, somehow we're going to pay it for them. So it's not only it's not consistent, it is incredibly difficult to try to come up with. I think this thing should be just left out. Okay, thank you for that comment. Uh, Representative Somsich. Uh, well, I, I got to agree with both Tim, uh, Representative Kelly Pitts and Representative Harrington about this, but uh, on the other hand, um, I think the, the, the verbiage that's already there, that we are talking, uh, I think on line 11, of the value provided to the electricity system. And we might be able to kind of boil this down to say um, that just and reasonable compensation should be provided for the value provided to the electricity system as determined by the commission. Uh, and uh, Representative Oxham tried to be more specific about that by saying that that includes uh, uh, other things. It includes the avoided transmission and distribution costs, but her language also mentions things like uh, determinable reliability and resiliency benefits. And uh, that, that sounds vague, but, but those things are done all the time. Uh, when there's a reliability project or a resiliency project, that is often justification for a project. So it's not so big, but I agree that we should try to strike out all these uh, terminologies and, and allow the commission to determine what the value of that contribution is to the electric system. And we also, we already say that they should be justly and reasonably compensated for the value, whatever that is, how, how it, whatever can be determined as the value without us getting into the details of that. So we're not excluding anything, but we're allowing uh, the commission to determine what is the value here. So Representative Sompsich, you would advocate on line 10, striking the language, including actual avoided transmission and distribution costs? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I suggest after just and reasonable compensation, I shall provide that uh, for the, and I would take the, the uh, two lines below at that phrase for the value it provides to the electricity system as determined by the commission. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Kelly Pitts. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here. What if, what if these projects are not valuable, but because they become so numerous, become a problem with intermittent power uh, entering the grid. So would people then be charged because there's a problem? And we have seen with the proliferation of some of these projects, small projects, have caused problems. Mm -hmm. So how do you control that? That intermittent intermittent electricity into the grid that well if we if the question is what is the value of that yeah electricity then okay. that's to be determined by the commission to be determined by the commission yeah. is that reasonable i don't know representative uh Oxenham, you're recognized but you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, 
First to the point raised by Representative Callie Pitts, the whole point of this is it deals with storage. This is what makes intermittent power not intermittent. This is, this is, this is the, the great step forward in technology to making distributed resources more available. So uh, I, I think you should feel reassured by the fact that this is uh, promoting energy storage. Uh, back to, the, to uh, your discussion, uh, Chairman Vos, with um, Representative Somsich, I'm a little concerned that what he said and what you said didn't dovetail. I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Somsich, I don't believe he wanted to eliminate the language about avoided distribution and transmission charges. I, he, his, point, his point was different from that. So I, I wanted to make sure we didn't lose that issue. Um, and, and then the, the final point I wanted to make was that, again, using a concrete example, if the utility is faced with a choice between putting in a substation, it's gonna cost 5 million, rather than, or putting in a storage system that's gonna cost 3 million to meet the same problem, the same issue on their system. They're saving $2 million if, if, they, if that is the choice that is made. If they're doing this on their own, then, then that's all handled inside of their own utility. But if they're working with an outside um, third party, the question is, is there a way to encourage and incentivize this very positive technology to be developed by having a share in that value apportioned to the third party? And again, this is not the kind of thing we can determine here. What we're saying is there is a possible value here. If the PUC can determine it, if it's clear that there's a money value, then this is what we want you to do. That's, that's what we're saying. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Representative Harrington. Uh, thank Representative you, uh, uh, Representative Sompson, uh, okay. you want to answer her question? Yeah. I, I agree with Representative Oxenham. I didn't mean to say we should drop the phrase, including actual avoided transmission distribution costs. I wanted to move that phrase of for the value provided to the electric system to be moved up uh, and uh, after compensation, and then to be, and then furthermore, it says as determined by the commission, including that. Okay, get it. Okay, thank you. Now, Representative Ham Harrington, you're up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just to uh, reiterate, the obviously cost-effective storage is the. Uh, is the golden uh, spike, if you will, that we're looking for. If we, we, we're going to be obviously been going forward with a lot of intermittent power, whether it's solar or wind, and this is the thing that makes it work much better. So we obviously cost-effective storage is a is a big plus. It's a game changer. Uh, just to put these things in perspective, when we're talking about transmission costs, and just so I think maybe people uh, get a better handle of how this is done. When a project comes up through ISO New England, a reliability project, they put in a preliminary estimated budget, and then they use that to see if the project is justified going through a process. Ultimately, that goes down to FERC, and FERC approves that. Now, what the first thing they file, the transmission company, is with FERC is saying that regardless what happens to this project, once it's approved, all reasonable cost, all prudent cost will be funded to the transmission company, even if the project gets canceled and never gets completed. So that and FERC says, yep, we're going to do that. You're going to get them even if the project's canceled and completed. But here's the thing you got to remember. The ISO New England criteria, unless it's changed, and I don't think it has, is the estimate is supposed to be within minus 50 percent to plus 200 percent. And I'll give you an example of one of the largest projects ever done in New England, which was uh, Southwest Connecticut phase two. It came in at about almost to the penny, 200% over the original estimate. So making this out as some kind of an exact science where someone's going to say, all right, if you put in this storage system here, it's going to save us X amount of dollars on transmission. Uh, that's a kind of a myth 
because no one has any clue as to how much that transmission is actually going to cost. When you have a procedure, when you have a policy that says minus 50 to plus 200 percent. And I got to tell you, I've never seen the minus 50 one, but I've seen a hell of a lot of plus 200 percent projects. It's just isn't it that an exact a science. So I just think leave this part out of it. Okay, thank you, Representative. Representative Oxenham. Um, can, can you hear me? Uh, hang on a second. <clears throat> actually, actually, I need to recognize Representative Platt first. Sure. Thank you. I find it ironic that uh, we encourage uh, distributed resources, generation, which may have a deleterious effect on the system reliability and, uh, and uh, uh, resilience. Uh, and don't hit them in with any cost for that. But now we want some people want to try to compensate storage to offset the bad stuff that's occurring with distributed resources. I just find uh, the, uh, a, a dichotomy they were thinking. Um, and with respect to Representative Harrington's point about transmission, what he said was true in a planning estimate only. When it gets down to the point of uh, pro uh, production, they're a lot closer than that. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, Representative Oxen. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just oh. to clarify, that right. that's what, what Fred Harrison. said is, is correct, but that's the point of approval is using the planning estimate. And once it's been approved, it, they get more exact as they go along, but they're already going to get all the prudent costs. That's the point I was trying to make. Okay, thank you. Representative Oxen. Yes, and, and can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I, I think the point here is not, it, I, at least my understanding of, of this text was that this, these are costs that are determined after the fact. The utility comes before the PUC and says, we spent X, this was our thinking, we could have done that, but we did this. These are actuals. They're not working prospectively, they're working on the, 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 what's the word, the repayment. Getting approval for the cost after the fact. So they know what the costs okay. are. All right, thank you. Okay, I think, uh, I think we've gone over everything we need to cover on that proposed amendment. We'll have a couple of changes coming before we see the final amendment. So with the remaining 50 minutes we have uh, for this, uh, this session, let's talk about part four. This is the limited, energy, limited electrical energy producers section of Senate Bill 91. And this is the section that provides us with the most difficulty, I think, because there is still some question in my discussion with a lot of people about whether any of this is in fact uh, legal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the Honorable Clifton Bilo to speak. And I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Bilo if you could answer a couple of questions to help us understand if this actually can be done legally or not. Uh, the first question I want to ask is if you look at page two of the proposed amendment, starting at line 14, it says that the limited producers shall receive credit for actual avoided transmission charges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm still not clear who provides those credits? So Mr. Bilo, could you answer that question for me? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, essentially, what, what this overall section does is um, clarify the state jurisdiction over distributed generation and storage that is not participating in ISO New England markets. And sort of under the federal state overall scheme, um, there's, there's not supposed to be any gaps in regulation. And under the Federal Power Act and the FERC and Supreme Court interpretations of it, 
Um, they say very clearly the state has jurisdiction over retail sales of electricity as well as within state wholesale. So within state wholesale sales, sale, sale to another party for resale only occurs for generation, which is not subject to FERC uh, jurisdiction. So that, that's all we're dealing with here, stuff that is by its nature state jurisdictional. The transmission credit um, would come from what's called the transmission cost adjustment mechanism, um, it is, in effect, part of retail rates, not the wholesale rates. The transmission owners and ISO New England would continue to charge the distribution utilities transmission service cost based on their share of the monthly annual, uh, not monthly, uh, monthly, not annual, on the monthly coincident peak, because the transmission charges are actually parceled out for the whole year uh, based on a single hour of peak demand in each month of the year. and. So um, the, 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 in essence, the revenue comes because all customers are paying two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, roughly, for transmission. It's a flat per kilowatt hour rate, even though the underlying cost is based on share of coincident peak. So, so you know, it, by its nature, some customers have more of that peak demand and others less, uh, but everyone gets charged the same amount. And, and to my mind, that's a deficiency in not providing an appropriate price signal that, that generation or storage that's on system peak is much more valuable than system generation or storage that is off peak, for instance. So just as a, as a mechanism, it, it recognizes that, okay, if you've got one megawatt that is generated locally and is used to offset load locally, um, then that is one megawatt that you do not have to buy from the transmission over the transmission grid from bulk larger generators under ISO, under FERC jurisdiction. So um, that is in its nature sort of a, a state regulated transaction. And the state only, the PUC only has to ensure that the, that the distribution companies get reimbursed the full amount of the transmission charges that go to them through whatever mechanism. So, so if, for instance, a one megawatt uh, distributed generator, limited producer under this statute, not participating in net metering, was producing one megawatt for every um, hour on every coincident peak hour of every month of the year, for instance, um, which is unlikely, you know, they're going to vary by month. And if it's solar or even with solar with storage, maybe not so much in the winter time, but it would, it would be avoiding the cost of about $130 per kW of that capacity that is not being charged to the distribution utility. And instead they could be compensated in effect 95% or less of that. I say 95% or less because it's based on its output before accounting for transmission and, and uh, transformation and line losses. And there's further language in here that if there's any issue about any uh, cross subsidy um, or cost shifting, that the commission could reduce that to a lower percentage. Uh, but the basic point is, if we don't have this kind of generation in the one to five megawatt range in the storage, then, and we get that from the bulk system, we will pay the $130 per kW per year uh, uh, for, you know, our, on our, based on our peak demands. If we can shave that peak demand, then there is a true avoided cost. It's actually quite discernible. It is the basis for Liberty Utilities battery pilot, which they're doing. And this simply says, let's that make, make the same principle that's being applied by the PUC with Liberty Utilities, make that same principle apply to a, 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 a third party owned battery storage system or generator that can produce on peak. Most solar does not produce on that peak. So the idea that this will give a lot of compensation to bare solar is, is not likely unless the solar is designed to produce on the monthly system coincident peak, which in the winter time is after dark. So, so this really provides, the point is to provide an appropriate price signal, which is to say, if you can reduce our costs uh, from what they would otherwise be by X amount, then you get 95% or less of that X amount and the rest of that savings could go to other customers. So that, that's a long answer to a short question. Thank you. It was a very long answer, but what I understood from that answer is that there would definitely be some kind of cost shifting. No. 
themselves. Because, be, themselves. because the customer, the retail customer would still be paying the exact same amount they're paying for transmission now. It's just that they would pay most of it to the transmission provider. And in fact, a small part of it would go to a limited producer that actually avoids that transmission cost. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a but for if, if you think we're going to get one to five megawatt limited producers without such a credit, then, then that, that might be true. They would be producing savings that they're not getting credit for. But I think it's unlikely we're going to get that. Um, and instead, we're going to see a push to expand net metering, which overcompensates in one realm, generation, and undercompensates in another realm, which is not giving credit for avoided transmission costs. But the first part of that lengthy sentence, you said that customers will still pay the transmission charges to their utility, but the limited producer will pay slightly less than that. So that has no, to no, necessitate, no, necessitate a cost shift, doesn't it? No, no, be, because the limited producer the limited producer only gets credit for the actual charges that they have helped uh, reduce or eliminate. And, and in the long run, there's value to this because um, you are avoiding or, you know, the, ins the structural incentive would be to sh shift, shave the peak, the coincident peak demand, which, you know, the more people do that, the wider the target becomes in terms of the number of hours you need to perform uh, to achieve that reduction. Um, uh, and if you can do so, then that actually helps avoid the need to um, have expensive, more new transmission investment be because you wouldn't need it to serve that load. Uh, it would be served locally instead, just, just like energy efficiency or, um, or, or uh, load shifting um, well, load shifting doesn't do it because you would pay, you pay regardless of when, when you consume. All right. So the second question about uh, this whole issue is if the transmission and distribution grids are so tightly integrated, is it going to be possible to determine or to segregate avoided transmission charges from charges attributable to the entire system? Uh, I, I think yes, because it's quite discreet. It's, it's, it's about $11 per kW per month. And it's a simple measurement. The uh, distribution utility gets a bill based on what their network load is at that hour of system peak. This only gives credit if the if the discharge to the grid, either from generation or storage, actually occurs at that hour of system peak. And just like Liberty calculates how much their batteries are saving each month, uh, because they figure out how much they've actually discharged the batteries at the system peak, in the same manner, you know, the same calculation occurs and says, okay, you've got one megawatt, that you produced on system peak that lowered our transmission costs by 1.05 megawatts or 1.07, reduces it by 1.07 megawatts on average. And we would have had to pay for 1.07, instead we'll pay you for one or, or less than one. And th there's no cost shift there. There's a small savings that uh, could grow over time as we avoid uh, some transmission investments that may otherwise be necessary if we're getting this power from a remote resource rather than a very local resource. And, you know, so, so yeah, the, the, the two systems are integrated, but there is an interface between them and reducing load on the distribution system, whether it's by load curtailment, energy efficiency, storage, or distributed generation, all has the same actual effect of lowering the amount of power that has to be moved over the transmission grid. And hence the size that that system has to be built to. Okay, so the next question is, will uh, the rates that utilities need to charge to recover their costs be affected by these limited producer credits? The transmission utilities? Yes. For the distribution. The transmission utilities? Well, there'll be two effects. One is um, they'll get, they'll get rev less revenue for a particular month in which this um, sort of 
reduced network load occurs. Um, th this, is, this is something that the um, just last week or beginning of this week, the Markets Committee of ISO New England voted 94.4% in favor of a tariff clarification that, that makes it clear that such generation would not um, would function to reduce the calculation of network load. So yes, the network load calculation would go down and the annual system peak for capacity charges as well would go down to the extent that we have new uh, storage or generation at these system peaks. Um, that has two effects. One for transmission, um, it, you know, combined with everything else that's going on with the economy, with energy efficiency, with beneficial electrification load being added to the system, um, it might uh, reduce um, the, the um, revenue uh, towards their revenue requirement. And they have a correction mechanism. So in, in theory, the revenue, uh, the next time they recalculate that, there might be a, sh a shortfall or there might be an overage. Um, and, and that will go into the calculation for the next period of time. But it also has the longer run effect of reducing the need for new investment in transmission to some extent. And what we know is that new investment in transmission, uh, a, a new, say, you know, megawatt of capacity on the transmission grid cost a lot more than the average megawatt of capacity does today. So adding more transmission at, to serve peak loads has an effect of, um, of, of raising the cost per kW of demand over time. Um, and, and, and the other fact is if we can shave these peaks and we actually have more consumption off peak, such, such as a battery that drop, you know, is charged up off peak and discharges on peak, then we're actually potentially selling more kilowatt hours total. So there is a potential positive effect of spreading cost over more kilowatt hours uh, without raising the peak demand, which will have the effect of, of shift lowering costs for everyone. Okay, Representative Platt is recognized for a question. A couple, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Or a couple of questions, go uh, ahead. Uh, I would ask uh, whether the, uh, let's say a, a leap is produ uh, produced, let's say it happens to be in Lebanon, selling to customers and somehow that does uh, avoid, uh, let's say a peak uh, at the Lebanon interface with the Eversource system. What happens to that transmission? Does it go away or does it still exist? I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, you're, you're, we would have to have a huge amount of such distributed generation and storage to be able to zero out our, our load at the system peak. If, we, if we're able to do it at system peak, we could probably do it all the time. In effect, in effect we will have set up a, a huge microgrid. Um, that, that, that's, we're you know, really, really far off from that. Um, um, so, you know, if in theory, everybody produced so much local power that they didn't need transmission, that, that's true. The, and the transmission system would still cost money. But I think the trend is the opposite. There, there's a big push uh, to increase electrification of vehicles and um, heating with heat pumps and such. Uh, so I think we're likely to continue to see growth in load. The question is, do we manage the peak uh, demand or not? So, so that we can kind of lower the cost per kilowatt hour, or, or if we don't have the price signals in place, like, like we, we don't have it with regular net metering, um, uh, there, there's no time differential on the kilowatt hours in net metering. Uh, so if, if you don't have some price mechanisms to recognize there's value to, to reducing peak demands, then, then we potentially will drive up the cost per kilowatt hour for everyone because People don't care whether they're adding load on peak or off peak. It, it, it's, there's no financial uh, signal for that. My, my follow-up question is whether what the purpose of transmission is simply delivery of uh, power to uh, a distribution system, or are there other uh, intents for that transmission, such as voltage regulation, frequency regulation, et cetera? Uh, uh, oh, yes. I mean, most of our power, like, you know, probably 99% of it comes from these bulk generators that are part of ISO, FERC regulated ISO New England market. And, and they can provide those services. Um, typically, 
uh, battery storage can also provide those services. They can do voltage regulation, power factor correction, uh, things like that with, with smart inverters. Uh, so potentially, and, and distribution utilities have to do some of that on their distribution grid as well with capacitors and such. Um, these additional distributed energy resources can actually be used to help manage and improve power quality on the distribution system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Harrington is recognized for a question. Representative Harrington, do you have a question? Your hand is up. All right, we'll come back to that. Uh, anybody else have a question or a comment about this particular legislation? Okay, Representative Oxen, you're recognized. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Velo. Could I, I you, you, you may, uh, I think, I, I'm sorry, I'm going, I'm going to not ask the question. I think it would take us into a, a, a different rabbit hole that, that might not be as productive as I originally thought. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Harrington, are you there yet? I guess not. All right, I'm gonna throw out a different suggestion. And that I is- I'm sorry, I had my, just forgot to take my hand down, which I will do now. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, all right, before I toss out my suggestion, I'll recognize Representative Callie Pitts. <coughs> While we have Cliff here, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned Cliff about the, about the uh, resiliency of the of the grid and the possible cyber attacks on the grid, will battery storage lower that, or do you need that that ability perhaps to hack the grid? Uh, battery representative, storage lower that, or do you need batteries to operate the electricity to operate that storage? mechanism. Representative Callie Pitts, I'm going to respectfully ask you to withdraw that question since it's not really relevant to the uh, bill that we're discussing, the section of the legislation that we're discussing. Could you take that question offline with uh, Mr. Below? Cliff, could you answer that by email for me? Is he gone? Sure, we'll, we'll do. Yes. By email. Thank yes, you. sure. Okay, thank you. So, the suggestion I'm going to toss out is given the uncertainty around the issues raised by this legislation, how would the committee feel about creating a study committee to study this issue to come up with um, a proposal that seems to be, to seems to, that can deal with all the vagueness and the unanswered questions that we seem to have about this bill? That's my proposal, and I'd like to hear your reaction to it. Including you, Representative Velo. I think we've studied it to death and we should push it forward. <laughs> Representative Oxenham. We have a situation where the PUC is currently examining the storage issue and they are well along in their deliberations. I think possibly retaining the bill and let's see what the PUC tells us they think they can do, uh, which was in fact the uh, upshot of the, of the previous legislation that was passed. Okay, well, thank you for that suggestion, but since this is an omnibus bill with five parts to it, I'm not sure we could retain one part I think we'd have to retain the entire bill. Representative um, Platt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The words, wording you have there now is just and reasonable. I think the commission can figure out just and reasonable. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, mm -hmm. there, there may be a lot of uncertainty, but they'll take that uncertainty into account and come up with whatever they come up with. All right, now we're starting to confuse parts one and parts four. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, 
the just and reasonable language was language we were gonna to add to part one. Now we're trying to figure out what to do with part four, which is the limited electrical producer, energy producers section. And I'd like to hear Mr. Bilo uh, comment on whether or not you think that we could obtain any additional information by creating a study committee. Um, I, I think you could um, create a study co committee to look at how to update RSA 362A 2A, this whole section about limited producers. Um, another, another idea that I'll just throw out is uh, you could um, make the enactment of part four uh, effective, put it off until January 1 of next year and say that the commission, that, 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 that the rules uh, under it shall not be effective before July 1 of next year. Uh, and, and then also set up the study committee uh, to take a, another look at it. And then you ha have plenty of time to introduce and pass legislation before any implementing rules become effective to modify or, or clean it up or, um, or repeal it for that matter. Uh, but, but I guess my concern is you've got this house rule that um, language that was ITL'd in the first year of the session can't be uh, taken up in the second year. Mm -hmm. and, and you've already killed two bills that are somewhat similar. Uh, so, so I guess that's my concern in, in, in suggesting maybe a, a, a enactment that's delayed uh, uh, by enough to give time for study committee to review it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think you'd probably benefit from people understanding this, this more thoroughly, yes. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that suggestion. Although I think the Senate could refile this bill. I don't think their rules are the same as the House rules. They could refile this bill if uh, uh, that, if that we, might be possible. If, if we change this just to a study committee. Um, Representative Oxenham, you still have your hand up. Do you want to make another comment? I do. It. <sighs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out, but between the, if, if we could retain the entire bill, um, it, it, it delays action. It, it, is there a loss to the other sections? Is there anything that we need to be moving forward before January 1st? Um, good question. Uh, you tell me, part one is the, energy storage piece, does that need to be uh, go forward? Well, that's the part that we were suggesting to retain was part one. And you said we couldn't do just part one, we'd have to do the entire bill because it's an omnibus. So I'm wondering if what, just trying to think through what it would be like to retain the bill at, in its entirety. I think the suggestion was that we retain or we could retain part four but now you're suggesting that we retain the whole bill. So that's a, that's a possibility. Representative McGee, welcome. I uh, hope you had a good delegation meeting. And Thank you. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It went a lot longer than it was supposed to go, but it was productive. Um, I guess I'm, you know, I'm coming late to the party here. And what I'm hearing is that we have questions on part four and since HB 407 was a bill that I had put in and I've been in some of the conversations um, leading up to today, I'm just curious if we have clearly articulated what those questions are. You're saying there's confusion around, uh, you know, if the bill went forward as part of the omnibus, how uh, that there might be some things for which there aren't clarification. And I, th I think some of that comes from us not having an understanding about how the PUC is going to rule, but they are going to have to figure out how limited electric energy producers operate properly and are compensated properly in the space. So I'm just wondering if we've identified in the conversation what the particular exceptions are uh, to passing four along with everything else as part of the omnibus. I'm not, I wasn't 
paying attention to exactly when you joined the meeting. So I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't very long ago. <laughs> I don't know how much of it you missed, but yes, I did articulate about three or four different questions. Oh, you did? Earlier uh, that we discussed with uh, Mr. Bigelow. And um, while his answers were, as, as always, uh, extremely um, technical and filled with information, they still left me with, with a few questions. And so what we're discussing now is the possibility of creating a study committee to try to come up with answers to those remaining questions. And Mr. Bilo's suggestion that we just change the effective date of this act from what it says currently that it'll take effect 60 days after its passage we could change that to a year from now, a year and a half from now, and also add, append a study committee section to the bill and uh, have the study committee try to answer those questions before the bill becomes, goes into effect. And if the result of that study committee was that the bill should not go into effect, then we could submit legislation to to repeal it. So that's the question we're, we're yep. pondering at the moment, which I think is a reasonable, potentially a reasonable approach. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Thank you. If we're not going to lose anything on time and we're still going to be able to get folks' questions answered in the interim, then at least it continues moving the ball forward. So I would think that would be reasonable. The Thank other reaction to the proposal to change the date, the effective date, and create a study committee to try to ascertain whether uh, this legislation will actually do what it's designed to do without causing any distress to the rest of the grid. Any further reaction? Uh, Representative Bernardi is recognized. In, in principle, I think it's a it's a good idea. You, you, uh, the date change allows us time to uh, to have the study committee to truly understand if we need to make further tweaks. Concept is good. Representative Harrington is recognized. I'll make a quick ditto. <laughs> That's very. Uh, Representative. Um, Pimentel is recognized. For clarification, the date change was only uh, for part four. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Oh, for, okay. Representative uh, Somsic is recognized. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also agree. I think this is a good solution to to delay the, the, the date um, uh, to a period of time where we can uh, have a study committee look at these questions and be able to clarify some. So I think that's a good solution, yeah. Okay, Representative Parshall is recognized. Yes, uh, you were asked, you were discussing earlier about us being, I, I'm forgive the term, in concordance with the Senate on this particular bill. That's a decision you, you need to make. Of course, this would affect that uh, an agreement, would it not? Now that that was a different bill. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. I thought it was this one. I, I do apologize. But I, I'm, I'm all whole, wholeheartedly feeling the same way that we should go ahead with the study committee. Okay, thank you. Representative Oxenham. <clears throat> I, I'm not sure about how we're proceeding. It's been suggested that you're only talking about a study committee for part four. I thought we were talking about a study committee to examine the issues raised in the bill because it, I, I don't think there was all that much confusion about section four. I thought that we spent most of the day talking about section one and that's the part that has more to do with the, um, the PUC proceeding that so my, I, I'm not sure that my comments were germane to the discussion if we're simply talking about section four now. You are correct. We are discussing section four. And what we are specifically are discussing is whether or not we should change the effective date 
of this section of the bill, just part four, uh, to a year from now or 18 months from now, and then append to the legislation the creation of a study committee to study the issue. But, but I'll be really providing a report by the uh, the 18th of November, yeah. and uh, that would allow us to to submit subsequent legislation if it was necessary. Uh, I, I don't believe we had real difficulty with understanding section four. I think the difficulty and that you know people are, are running the, the two together and uh, that difficulty in understanding the compensation mechanisms in section one. Uh, section four is really quite straightforward. Uh, I'm not sure the two are particularly closely related, but um, that's one of the problems with omnibus bills. You get parts to them that are sort of related, but not directly related. And so that, that yeah. leads to confusion. But yeah. to, to answer your question specifically, yes, I think there are questions uh, about how this would work that the legislation doesn't make clear. And uh, many of us still have questions about how this would actually work. That's why we. Uh, that's why we're strugg struggling with it at this point. Uh, and, and, and why the study committee would make sense. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why we're debating whether to do a study committee or not. Right, but is it section one and four, or is it simply section four? Be because I said I think we've we've allowed our difficulties in one area to bleed over into the other area and where we, where we really need a study committee, it seems to me where, where there are issues that people don't seem to understand and, and where it is complicated are, are in a different section, but that's enough. Yes, we're talking specifically about in, adding a study committee for section four only. Representative McGee. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and that was back to my question of what were the questions because you know that was what I wanted clarification on because I don't I have written uh, notes on the original part four for questions that came up at the time like a dividing line between distribution and transmission was something that was brought up avoided transmission costs or sh cost shifts were were brought up but I I didn't think any of those were Many of those are the reason that the bill says that the commission shall initiate rulemaking because they can't be known before they're known. And so it's a cart before the horse thing again. And I would just, that's why I wanna know what questions are we trying to satisfy with a study committee? Because it doesn't seem to me like there's much question beyond that. It's just that those questions will have to come after the legislation is passed in, an, in another agency that's tasked with that. So I, th that's, what I, that's what my question was, is what, what are the open questions that we're trying to resolve by not letting it go forward as, it, as it's written? Okay, good question. Uh, I will send you a, a written summary of the questions that we discussed before you arrived. Okay, so thank you. Know, know what they are. Okay. Representative Harrington, your hand is still up. Do you have a, another question? No, forgot again, I'll take it down. <laughs> Representative Oxenham, your hand is still up. Do you have another question? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I, I really do think it, it's too bad the cat wasn't here, but I think that she would be saying the very same thing now if she had been here all morning. What is it that is the problem? Because it's, and I think we all, we all need to understand that and, and having a discussion offline doesn't help us in this work session to get to the point of saying how we want to proceed, which is the, the work that we're here to do right now. So are you asking me to, to, to re-ask the questions I asked earlier? It, 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 if you would, sir, I think it would be helpful to, to all of us. Okay, the questions I asked earlier included The limited producer shall receive credit for actual avoided transmission charges. Credit from whom? That's a question number one. Uh, question number two, the 
transmission and distribution grids are so tightly integrated, how does one determine what's transmission versus distribution? Can the two really be segregated? Question number three, are there in fact avoided costs and who pays those avoided costs? And there was a fourth question that I don't remember off the top of my head, but I can go back and look at the uh, recording again to refresh my memory. But those are the kinds of questions that I think a study committee, committee needs to ask and get concrete answers for. Actually, I think those are pretty straightforward questions and we might actually be able to get Mr. Bilo to answer them for us. Well, he did attempt to answer them, but I'm not entirely satisfied with those answers. And I think I'm, 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 get another perspective. I mean, Representative the issue of, of can transmission and distribution costs be segregated? They are all the time. I mean, that's that's why one's called transmission costs and one's called distribution costs. You know, I mean, the, the PUC and the ISO, and you know, that that's that's an issue. Again, not for the legislature. That's not a policy issue. That's that's for those who deal with the technical details, and they do it all the time. They're they're perfectly competent to do that. In, in terms of who should receive the credit, I, I think that's a, a, a something that someone on this call must know. I, I, I would assume it's the PUC, but maybe it's ISO, but it's, again, that's an issue, a technical issue that would be worked out by the, the people who have to actually do that. Um, and then with, are there in fact avoided costs? I mean, I mean we have a situation where ISO rewards people for avoided costs. You know that that's that's monetized. That's that's being done. Again, this this is something that the the technical people who handle these issues they they do this. I I, I don't think this is a reason not to proceed with what we found in in our last discussion to be a, a very positive bill that that should that should be moving forward and that there are many you know we have a renewable energy industry in this state. We, we have produced, we have people engaged in this who are standing by waiting for the legislation to enable them to go forward. And for us to say, gee, I don't know if we can just distinguish that. We don't need to. What, but I do think we could just simply have to say that we trust the competence of the agencies that make these decisions for us. And that's, that's why the PUC is there. That's why they have their proceedings and their staff and work out the details and my God, thank God they do. But again, I don't see these things as, as, as holding up going forward for the bill or needing a study committee because they're not really issues for us. Okay, thank you, Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that that was a point that I, I tried to make earlier. The other thing I was thinking is from the nature of the questions, which I'm thank you for providing them, is that when we had the presentation on how renewable energy uh, economics works uh, to try and get some of us further along in our understanding of the pricing models and, the, and the, the way things are working currently in our energy economy. Um, when you talk about the credit for avoided, I, I think it's not a credit like who pays the credit, it's getting credit uh, in other words, maybe paying a lower rate because of the credit you're bringing to the system. I think that's the complexity of understanding it that we might not all get. We might not all be experts on our committee that understand how that market is going to work, but that is that is what the rate setting agency is going to determine. They're going to they're going to determine whether any costs are transferred. Uh, and uh, and my understanding is from the presentation that we had that the value of renewables coming onto the distribution grid has been priced, and we had that in testimony, has been priced at much higher than the rates that are currently being paid, like the default rate and that sort of thing. So I think we have to trust that, um, that there is a value to people generating uh, energy locally and creating additional resilience within the system so that it's not all dependent on one central location that can be brought down just like that 
cyber attack that we just saw that shuts it down for everybody. You know, there's a value. And so um, the fact that we don't understand the value, I don't think should be an inhibitor for us being able to allow this portion of the bill to go forward. And that's the reason that I asked the original question is because I thought section four was also straightforward. The only questions that I heard put forth were from Eversource's attorney, Matt Fossum. And the questions that he asked were sort of refuted by attorneys who work in, in, uh, in the FERC field, you know, after the fact, they basically said, no, that's, that's not the way it works. And I think Cliff has said it in testimony to us several times. So there's no uh, concern for limited electric energy producers coming online and starting to function and helping people to produce energy where they live and trying to lower costs and trying to manage peak demand and trying to implement storage systems. That stuff is all good for New Hampshire. That's not going to, um, it's not gonna affect the transmission grid because the energy isn't gonna be going over the transmission lines. And that was the point that he was trying to make. He's like, well, I don't know that FERC wouldn't be involved. And I think we got the answer that that's not true. That was the only question that I saw or heard. <laughs> I just didn't see the question, but the only question that I heard that uh, made people go back and start scratching their heads, like, is that something we have to be concerned about? And I believe the answer after the fact was, it isn't. It, it hasn't been an issue. That's why this bill keeps coming back in front of us. And that's, uh, I think, why the Senate put it forward as well, to try and make sure that it doesn't lose another cycle. So that's my spiel. <laughs> okay, thank you for your spiel. <laughs> so I think we have a path forward then uh, for this legislation. I think that um, trust but verify is an important uh, concept that many of us feel is, is justified here and a study committee I think could uh, potentially give us the verification that we need that uh, this proposed legislation can move forward. So I think uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, add a study committee to the text of part four and we'll change the date on the effective, change the effective date of the legislation, uh, 18, 18 months or two months, uh, two years out to give the study committee time to uh, provide the verification that um, what's contained in the legislation is actually implementable. So we'll put that all together and I'll have a, an amendment for everyone. I'll submit all this to OLS tomorrow. And then as soon as OLS can act, we'll have an amendment for SB 91 that contains a new language for part one, uh, new language for part four, it eliminates uh, part five altogether. And as soon as all us can supply us with that um, amendment, I will send it to everybody. And then we will plan on having an executive session on the amendment on either Monday or Tuesday of next week. And I'll also let you know about uh, which of those two days we'll be meeting. I think uh, right now it looks like we might be able to meet on Monday. So. Uh, from information I just received a little while ago. So I'll keep you posted. And in the meantime, I'll ask uh, Representative Callie Pitts if she'd like to make a comment. So my comment is simply that I understand the, the value in a study committee, but why not just retain part, you know, put an, another date on section four and do a subcommittee so that we can bring it back ASAP. Because if you form a study, if we form a study committee, Years. being, hmm? Excuse me. Uh, no, that's, I, I do not understand why we wouldn't defer to a study committee so that, that the people who are working on this now, who may not be here when you envision a, a, a subcommittee ending, would be able to work on it and get it get it out as soon as possible. That's all. Okay, thank you for that comment. Uh, <clears throat> anybody else have anything else they need to add? We're almost at the lunch hour, time to adjourn the meeting. 
Uh, Representative Oxenham, do you have a last comment? And just a second, what was said that I think a, a subcommittee and let's let's get this thing in the works and you know January one. But let's not be talking eighteen months to two years. That's completely unnecessary, and it would really be holding up. It, it would be a drag on the New Hampshire manufacturing, on our renewable energy, it, it, and it's not helping us get to any of our goals uh, with the 10-year energy transition, none of them. Representative Mann, you get the last word. Yeah, I just have to say, um, I, I envision in the future a pretty complex system of many, many, many components scattered all over the state, all over the region, and um, I think we're going to need a pretty good computer system to keep that reliable. Um, we have to, you know, eventually we will someday be wondering about the, um, the vulnerability of such a system. The uh, current... Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good topic, a separate topic, but a good Yes, topic. it is a very separate topic. Less vulnerable than one centralized system that goes down with a flick of the switch. <laughs> Well, okay, so this is a productive work session. I thank you all for uh, your attendance. I apologize that we had to reschedule the presentation on HB2, the Department of Energy, but that was out of our hands. The Senate um, took away our presenters basically by forcing them to uh, do a presentation before the Senate Finance Committee. So uh, we will reschedule that potentially for next Monday, the 24th, after we do our exec sessions. We'll have that uh, presentation from the governor's staff on the Department of Energy and HB2. So everybody have a wonderful week and a wonderful weekend, and we will see you a, uh, a week from today. I just wanted to mention something. <laughs> okay. okay. Quickly, quickly. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, I wasn't sure if anyone was aware with Representative Mann's comment that the statewide energy data platform, which is now called the Energy Data Hub, um, went to the Public Utilities Commission for a settlement hearing between the utilities and all of the stakeholders that have been working on it for the last 17 months. And I was one of the interveners on that. So I got to sign the settlement agreement and uh, they're in deliberations now, but um, they, what we asked them for was approval to submit an RFP based on all the requirements that had been defined during that process with a lot of technical folks. And so we will actually have a tool that will allow us to see what we cannot see now for this energy that's coming online, because it's a very important piece uh, to Representative Mann's point of having um, a dispersed and diverse energy system. You're going to have to have some way to look at it and to do planning. And we don't have that today. So that's, uh, that's what that project was all about. And I just wanted this group to know that um, it's, it's at least gotten out of the gate with uh, a settlement with the utilities, um, which was hard fought and won. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, with that, we will adjourn this meeting and reconvene a week from today. Uh, keep an eye on your email inbox for uh, the exact meeting details. Thank you and take care of you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.